Good morning to our polar bear edition of the Isaiah class. Is it five degrees or ten degrees outside? Anyways, you're here. God bless you all. Okay, we're gonna pray, and then we're gonna. You're actually you're gonna you're gonna have to go into brain power in a minute here. So you gotta, gotta something. I got a question for you, Father. We ask that you would bless, that you would instruct, help, and speak to our hearts, Father. That we would have not only hear what's being said and what we read, but we would have revelation of what we see and hear today. That you would speak to us through it. In Jesus' name we pray. And help us speak it to others in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. Hey, Pastor Handel, um, we have cards going around for Leah. Send Leah, Leah a card. Leah, yeah. sweetie. sweetie. I have a card going around. Cards going around for Leah, sweetie? Okay. Do you need to space her? Okay. 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 A couple of things I want to get to just uh, with our administration of the class. Uh, really, we are a team of people, and one of those people on that team is Michelle Fitch. Michelle, wave to everybody there. Okay. Now, one of the things she's collecting your addresses and emails, one of the things she's going to send you is Marlene was kind enough to take the time to write a transcript of every class we've had so far. She's up to the fourth class. And they're going to be sent to you. So you have, you'll have a written transcript of everything that went on, which is a, a great benefit. Secondly, she's working on printing That's a go take to home. Now. Yeah, go, go get that okay. printed. She's a take home uh, test. And uh, we'll go over it once you have a copy of it. You have two weeks to do it. The idea is it will force you to do a thorough review of what we've had. And that's the idea. I prefer the take home than a. Uh, Traditional test because, well, I remember my college days. Study, memorize, take the test. A week later, can't remember what's on the test. And I, I don't know if that's very valid. You know, if what I taught you forgot a week later, why give the test? But if you do the take home, it will force you to review your notes and you'll have a written record of important facts and information in the class for your review later on. So I prefer it that way. Okay? And then I'm not like preferring the student who's better at memorizing than the one who isn't. Some of you, you know, memorization is not your thing. Uh, you don't have to admit to it. But anyways, you don't have to do that. But you do have to review. Okay. So those things, yes. Now, grab your boards for a minute. We're going to start you with a question. And I'm going to use the board up here a little bit. Yeah. You're going to give to me four themes, or what you think are the most dominant themes in the book of Isaiah. I'll give you a clue. We have covered all four of them. We've touched on them in some degree. Now, think over what we've been studying, what you've been learning, and on your boards, try to write four important themes that we have looked at. I mean, there's more than four in this book, obviously. But the most, the most common ones, the most important ones. I want to see what you come up with. Then the class will be on the four themes that I, you know, I believe are the most dominant ones for the club. But I want to see what you can do coming up with them right now. You can talk with each other while you're doing it. Take a minute, think about it, write them down. You can copy from each other. This is not a test. This is cooperative learning. <laughs> As a classroom teacher for many years, I, I realized that kids do an awful lot of learning look at what's on each other's papers. So I've learned to maximize that instead of penalizing. So when the test comes, I, you know, I remove them to the four corners of the room so I can't keep doing that. Now, four themes, dominant themes, major themes, the book of Isaiah. Pastor Handel, can I just ask, yes. how many people are taking the take-home test? I see you know how many times you take. Uh, yeah, hand count if you want to take home test. We will. Keep your hand way up high. Come up. Two, three, four, Thanks. Five, you can help me. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you, 12. Yeah, one here you probably missed. 12 is good. Your excuse for this assignment. Appreciate it. 
know what to say. Do your homework. <laughs> Oh, okay. We give you about thirty seconds more. By the way, for those of you who are educators who wanted to know, one of the proven ways to teach something is to test people on what they know first and then teach it after. So you're kind of doing that a little bit. There's something about it. Okay? And as I mentioned, you can check with each other, talk with each other, discuss them, look at each other's boards. All those things are in there. Yeah. I could pick four that I think are the most important. You pick several. Yeah. some boards and, and show some of those here. Probably the best way to do it. Okay, we have the Gospel according to Marlene here. <laughs> this is probably the, I, it's, I, I wouldn't say the one mentioned the most, but it's probably the most important thing. Jesus Christ, Messiah. And she wrote, now she wrote with it a kingdom, eternal kingdom reign. Isaiah covers the life of Christ from eternity past to eternity future, not just from cradle to grave, but the the whole story of Messiah is in Isaiah. So if you just wrote Jesus, his life, you know, but that's that would be theme number one. So I'm gonna give that back to her. So I'm gonna write up here. I'm gonna just quickly here. Messiah. <coughs> And that's why I asked you, by the way, we have about, was it three weeks or four weeks left for you to finish your gospel according to Isaiah? You know, some of you are doing that for homework, working on that. That's why I did a major thing. Now, I noticed a couple, Rob, I want to take your board next here. Uh-oh. Don't judge my spelling. Okay? He's still He's got a lot of good things in there, there. all in the book. I'm going to pick a couple of these out here. He mentioned here the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord, 98% of the time to 100% of the time, is the seven-year tribulation. And it is a major theme in the book of Isaiah. Many times he speaks of it. Often. He keeps bringing it up. So I would just write for a second theme. You could write the day of the Lord or the seven-year tribulation. They are, they are one and the same. Some commentators will tell you that the day of the Lord speaks of a, of, a, of a difficult day, a trying day, a day of judgment, and it does. But really, when you study it out, most of the time, almost all the time, it's speaking literally of a seven-year tribulation period that will come upon all that are on the earth. So that's, that would be a second one that he's got here. And then, let's see. Yes. Underneath it here is written the millennial reign of Christ. The thousand year reign of Christ. The time of peace. And I know one of the class, I think I gave you five scriptures describing the millennial reign. That's when the, you know, when the wolf and the lamb lie down together and nobody has lunch on each other. Okay? All right? And uh, beat their, their, their weapons of war into farm instruments. Okay? So I'm going to put that one down. And there's, then there's one, we'll get a couple more here. So, Jesus, then, we do them in order. I guess we have 
Uh, we can write Day of the Lord. Day of the Lord would be a second thing which really speaks of the tribulation. Officially, the seven year period, you can speak of it as a tribulation. Midway through the tribulation, after three and a half years, in the book of Revelation, it, it, it calls it the Great Tribulation. So often we use we speak of the whole period as the Great Tribulation. Officially, it's the last three and a half years of that tribulation period are called in the scriptures the Great Tribulation. And that's it, that's a major theme in Isaiah. Then the millennial reign, let's hope I can spell it right. Did I get it right? Or I need two ends there. I think that's right. Two ends? Two. No more. <clears throat> I think there's two ends here. Unusual. I hope I saw it right. <laughs> Millennial reign. Right Forget the I before E except after C. Anyways, <laughs> got that spelled right. Okay. And then there's one more theme. I might walk around and see if I can find this on anybody. See who worded it well. Hello, Melanie. He's a kid on it. I want to see who says it the best here. Nice. Hey, Bernie. How are you doing? Seven, seven for Jack. Oh, yeah. Give me a quick, quick tutelage on it. Hopefully, I don't screw it up. Alright. Okay. Josh is, is, is hit on it. I'm going to word it a little differently. Good job, Josh. The theme that is spoken about most in the book is God's dealing with Judah, their backsliding, and his chastisement upon them that will bring them to repentance. That's the thing that's actually spoken of the most. It has perils. So I'm going to what we call it. Um, God's, let's call it God's dealings, we could say it differently, uh, with Judah and uh, really often the city of Jerusalem. Being is going to be the world's capital <laughs> someday, and if you will, the greatest city on earth. Uh, what happens to it is important to the scriptures. And of course, there's chastisement, there's backsliding. But well, as we said, even in chapter 1, uh, Christ's kingdom in Jerusalem. Christ's kingdom in, in Jerusalem. Yeah, you, you, you got it. So it's, it, these themes also can overlap with each other. But I would say that these are the four major themes. Now we're going to go through some points on each of them. These are the four major themes that you're going to see in Isaiah. The hard part about it is this. I'll give you an analogy. It's been said many times when the Greek philosophers were done philosophizing, there wasn't much to well, much less to philosophize about. It's like they covered all the bases. I say it, it's like that. It's not just a mini gospel, it's a mini Bible. It's like, is there an important Bible thing that he did not speak of? That's hard to find. It's almost like it's it's a book in itself, it's a Bible in itself. So there are many things that in it that are perhaps not a major thing. It's one of the reasons he's considered such a great prophet. And I'll mention one more thing about that. People who look at Hebrew literature consider the book of Isaiah to be the greatest piece of Hebrew literature ever written. And that has to do with content, with style, uh, the expressions he uses, what well, we would call idiomatic expressions, the, the pictures he, the word and, and pictures he paints, the different, he uses so many different style, different techniques to bring things across. It's very varied how he deals with things. And because of it, we often remember and quote his words because when Isaiah said it, he said it really well. So you're actually reading one of the greatest pieces of literature ever written in Hebrew, probably the greatest. You're, you're reading a book that covers all the bases. It's a mini Bible in itself. I knew it covered Messiah well, but I didn't realize how it covered everything else so well. Now, this is one of the reasons why, and this is one thing that makes it difficult. Like, you get lost in this book. 
I mean, he'll get you found sooner or later, but because there's so much in it. It's a loaded book. Someone recently said, oh, you're teaching Isaiah. That's a very difficult book. I says, no, that's a loaded book. And there's all kinds of treasures in there. So we're going to look at some of those treasures today. Okay. On your next test, I'll ask you the same question. <laughs> One of the four major themes. Now, we may make a list of some of the other important things that are there, but not covered so thoroughly, too. But that list will get, you know, it'll get very long. He didn't miss much, if anything. So, theme one. And I'm actually, this is, uh, I'm actually taking somebody's notes who, who talked about this, and some information here. Almost one-third of the chapters in the book of Isaiah concern prophecies about Jesus Christ. Now you've got 66 books. And you can say a third of them speak of prophecies of Jesus sometime in his life or, or if you will, in his eternal state. It, it takes us into that, actually. So, uh, addressing both his first and second coming. All right? Usually people think of his birth, his death, his resurrection, but he does not stop there. He, talk, he speaks about the, uh, the, the seven-year tribulation period, the millennial reign, and even he touches on the eternal state after the millennial reign. Now, some of you are lost. The eternal state. You're not going to see that phrase in the Bible, but it describes something. Uh, at the end of this age, there will be a there will near the end of it, there will be a rapture, a taking up of the church. And critics say, but the word rapture is not in the scripture. You just you pre-tribulation people make that up. But the word harpuso is in the Greek. And that's how Jesus explained the rapture, he called it a harpuso. Well, what does it mean? It's the same word used if someone snatched your purse. You know, they grab it and run. An angel's going to do that with you. People grab you and run. You're going to meet the Lord in the air. You're going to be a harpuso. So, uh, you know, it's, I don't know, that's, that just shows the stupidity of, the, of their position. But anyway, they'll get it another time. So, you're going to be harpuso. After you're harpuso, soon thereafter, the Antichrist will come to power and he will, he will sign a peace treaty with Israel, according to the book of Daniel. When that peace treaty is signed, that day, the seven-year tribulation begins. At the end of that seven-year tribulation, Christ will return. Let's put it this way. He has come once to his people. He's coming a second time, the rapture, for his people. The third time, the second coming of Christ, at the end of the seven-year tribulation, he's coming back with his people. What? To his people? For his people. In the birth of Christ in Isaiah. For his people, the rapture. And... Now that he has us in heaven, he can bring us back literally on white horses. If you like horses, you're going to love it. If you don't, you're going to learn to ride. So, he's coming back with us at the end of the seven-year tribulation. We teach the, pre, the eminent return of Christ, which means he can come at any moment. Jesus said, in a day when you think not, if Christ does not come before the tribulation, we know exactly when he's coming. You've got seven years, mark your calendar. And we then we do not have a, a eminent return. We don't have a surprise return. We know. The rapture is is the surprise. When it'll happen. Okay. So at the end, when he comes, the tribulation is over. At the end of the tribulation, all of Israel who is left and not destroyed by the Antichrist will believe on him and call on him and he will come. The last three days of the tribulation, they will call on him and he will come. At that point, when he comes, he will set up a kingdom which will last for a thousand years, the millennial reign of Christ. But Isaiah goes beyond that. At the end of the millennial reign, according to the book of Revelation, the, 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 the devil will be loose for a season, he will deceive the nations, they will attack Jerusalem, and they will be, uh, they will be destroyed a moment of time. At that point, we get a new heaven and a new earth. During the millennial reign, we get a restored earth. At the end of the millennial reign, we get a new heaven and a new earth. Theologians call that period the eternal state. 
Time is no more and eternity is forever. And there will be no more sin. And there will be no suffering and there will be no tears. And an everlasting joy shall be upon our head according to scriptures. So Isaiah covers all those things. Now, just see when I mention these things. So he takes us right into the eternal state. So I say from eternity past to eternity future. All right. Now, let's see here. They've mentioned some of the things here. Uh, his first and second coming, that's all I got into it, yes. Isaiah provides more prophecy of the second coming of Christ than any other Old Testament prophet. That's amazing. He says more about it, about the second coming than, than you know, and that is the seven year tribulation and the coming of Christ at the end of it. He says more than any other prophet. So, they mention some things here. You can write them down. The, uh, he shall judge between the nations, Isaiah 2 4. He's called the branch of the Lord in Isaiah 4 2 and Isaiah 11, 11 1. This is a short list. This could be much longer. His virgin birth in 7 14 and in 8 8 in verse 10. Uh, that's where he's called Emmanuel. He's called Emmanuel, I believe, four times in the book of Isaiah. I think it's four. It might be three. Uh, he's also called the stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. We have not spoken about that, but it's repeated in the New Testament. He's a stumbling block. Many, you, him, that, you know, that, that kid from Nazareth, he's like, he's the Messiah? Yes, he's the Messiah. He was a stumbling block to many. So, and as I mentioned, his eternal government uh, will be upon a shoulder. That is in Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. And a few more points is for this theme of, of Jesus as Messiah going beyond cradle and grave. The Holy Spirit will rest upon him in all of its full. There is no limit. When the Spirit came up, with no limit to that fill. When you are filled with the Holy Spirit, this is there's a measure. The measure you receive has to do with the ministry you've been given. If you've been called to something, there is a filling and enabling of the Spirit to the thing that you're called to do. And, but with Jesus, there was no limit to this. It was unlimited filling, if you will. He's the tried stone, the precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, Isaiah 28, 6. And this one that this uh, commentator didn't quote, I put it in red here, this is my edition. He would rise from the dead and be made alive again. And I'm going to show you the case for that. And it's... Um, Maybe not explicit, but it's implied. We're going to show you that. So, Christ is directly spoken of in more than half of the chapters between Isaiah 40 and Isaiah 61. From the first chapter to almost the last chapter, periodically God goes after the Jews and the sins that they're living in. We'll show you that. He, did, we, he, he went after them in chapter 1. He goes after them again in chapter 59. And the list in 59 is longer than the list in chapter 1. <laughs> so they weren't making any progress. <laughs> Let's put it that way. But, when you get later on in the book, the message of hope and the message of Messiah get stronger. So the book ends on a note of hope, and Messiah is our hope. So, uh, and of course, I, I, we haven't talked about it yet, we have to do it. His suffering in Isaiah 53. You might want to put with that Psalm uh, 22. is a description of his crucifixion. We'll look at both together. Alright? Now, the case for his resurrection in the book of Isaiah. Inferred. This gets interesting. Isaiah chapter 26 verse 19. Thy dead men shall live. Write in your notes, please. This speaks of the resurrection. As the Apostle Paul said, the hope of the Jews has always been the resurrection from the dead. A physical resurrection. Job spoke. He says, after, after the death worms have feasted on me, I will see God in my flesh. A resurrected body. And, uh, you know, Isaiah speaks about this in first that the dead men shall live. Now here's where it gets interesting. Together with my dead body. 
shall they arise. The question is here, is Isaiah speaking of his own dead body? Or is he speaking for the Lord where the dead body is the dead body of Jesus? And I, 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 well, we're going to show you some notes on this. I study this thing out. It could be taken either way. And the best case I can say is that it was written in Hebrew, so it could be applied three different ways. Honestly, Hebrew is a fascinating language. It will drive you crazy, too. <laughs> because it's packed, it's loaded. It makes inferences, implies different things, so it can say two or three things at the same time. Well, which one are they talking about? I think that's why eventually they went to Greek. But anyway, anyways, uh, it's, it's, we're going to look at that a little bit. Let's look at it here in the Young's Literal Translation. This is a big deal. This is talking about the resurrection. This is, this is our hope, folks. All right? So, Isaiah 26, 19, Young's Literal Translation. Thy dead live. My dead body, they rise. Now why is it choppy like that? Hebrew doesn't put all those connecting little words in between. It just says things. I mean, you've got to sort them out after. And he uses a different word order. So when Young does a literal translation, he says, I will put things in the order that they're listed in the Hebrew, and then you've got to figure them out. That's what's going on here. Thy dead live. I love that. Yes, 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 yes. My dead body, oh, well, hey, it could be my dead body. I guess I want my dead body, but this may be the dead body of Jesus we're talking about here. And it may be Isaiah speaking of himself, and I'm not sure which. So, awake and sing, you dwellers in the dust. Yes, this is those who are dead. <laughs> okay? For the dew of, of, of herbs is thy dew, and the land of Rephraim thou causest to fall. Now, what is Rephraim? It's a word that can mean dead corpses. It's a word that can mean giants. It's the word that can mean ghouls and weird creatures. It has about six different meanings. So uh, it, it may even infer that the demons fall and we what? Nice. We rise. I like it that way. <laughs> but I'm saying because it has many meanings, you can do different things with this word. So. Now, let's go from there a little farther here. I also have it in the Hebrew-English interlinear. This is one you can look at yourself if you don't have any, if you have a computer. There's a thing called Scriptures for All, the website here. They have a Hebrew-English interlinear where you can see the Hebrew word writing and word for word how it's translated in English. Because Hebrew is a loaded language, you can have two or three viable translations of many of these verses. Some of you have ever done that before with Hebrew? Anybody who's tried that? You know what I'm talking about. Okay? Let's just say it's a lot of fun. Okay? You know, I'm going to figure this thing out, maybe. But anyways, you can see how challenging it is to translate. They shall live, ones being dead, of you carcass. That's somebody's carcass. I, th I think it could be the Lord's carcass here. Uh, of me... They shall rise, awake you, jubilant, one's tabernacling of soil, that night mist of lights, night mist of you, and land, and land healers she is casting down. I, I, you saw some different translations on them. Now you can see why the King James doesn't get into all this. Or most translators don't. It's so loaded, sometimes I just say, no, we're not, we're not even going to try to get into that. Okay, so, let me see what I got here. This is how it appears in interlinear when you look at it. That's what I'm actually, that's what I actually got this thing from. You can do that if you want. You can't read it there, but that's how it comes out. And we'll, we'll leave you with, with that one, all right? I won't got to speak any more about that for now. But what's very clear from this verse, there is a resurrection. Two minute break here. Bernie's got to turn off the camera and turn it on. Well, he's doing that. I want to just say thanks to different people.